All right, for those of you guys who've been missing memes of my cats, here we go again. Um, so what we're going to talk about during this lesson uh, are mutations. And we're going to talk a little bit about the consequences of mutations as it relates to evolution. And we're going to also talk about some mechanisms of gene transfer. So what is a mutation? A mutation is any change in nucleotide sequence, um, and this can happen in a couple of places. This can either be at the level of an individual nucleotide or nitrogen base, or it can involve entire chunks of chromosomes. Um, this can have various effects. It can change a trait. Um, if it changes a trait, that's usually due to a change in the amino acid sequence of a protein that's being produced, and it can either change the actual protein being produced, or depending on the location of the mutation, if it's in some regulatory stretch of DNA, it can change the type, well, actually the amount of protein that's produced as well. Any of those can lead to a difference in trait. So let's look at a super famous example of a mutation. Um, and this one is super famous because it's an example of a single nucleotide mutation leading to a single amino acid change in a protein that somehow has a huge impact on an entire person's life. And this is sickle cell anemia. So sickle cell anemia is a disease that's caused by a mutation in the hemoglobin protein. Hemoglobin, if you don't remember what it is, is a reddish molecule that's found in high concentrations in red blood cells, and it is the actual protein that carries oxygen around inside the blood. So uh, this is the normal shape of hemoglobin. Uh, it's technically the beta subunit. Uh, and what you'll see is it then interacts with these other subunits to form these normal hemoglobin molecules. They're each going to be physically separate from each other. You're just going to pack a bunch of them into a red blood cell, and each of them is going to be able to carry oxygen. If you have a single mutation from a glutamate at position 6 to a valine, that is going to cause a conformational change in the protein. We'll talk a little bit about why that's the case when we talk more about biochemistry, but you'll notice it changes the shape of this protein. And it exposes a hydrophobic region. If you remember from either freshman bio, or I don't know if you talk about this in chemistry, a hydrophobic region is going to be repelled by water. And in fact, any exposed hydrophobic regions on a protein um, will cause that protein to kind of clump up so that all hydrophobic regions are not exposed to water. Instead, they are going to bind to other hydrophobic areas or clump with other hydrophobic regions. So that way they're protected from water almost. So if this is a hydrophobic region right here, then these proteins you'll notice clump together so that way they are not exposed to water. Instead of forming these just, you know, pockets or a bunch of hemoglobin inside, they start forming these chain-like structures. They form these fibers. They have a reduced capacity to carry oxygen, which is bad because they're not able to carry oxygen to your cells. And then they also change the shape of the red blood cell. This is important because capillaries are super tiny. Um, a, ca a capillary is barely big enough for a red blood cell to go through single file. If you change the shape of it, so it's now, notice that this sickle cell to the red blood cell shape um, is basically going to interfere with a red blood cell trying to go through a capillary. So if that red blood cell tries to go through a capillary, it'll probably get clogged up. It'll um, clog that capillary, you'll no longer be able to get red blood cells going through, and anything upstream of that is not going to get and its oxygen delivered to it. It can also form some kind of clots and cause problems in blood flow, which is why sickle cell was most often fatal pretty young in a person's life before modern medical treatment. So a single change, a single mutation led to this devastating disease. So, not all mutations are negative or harmful. Uh, some can be positive. Uh, most mutations are either going to be either negative or neutral, meaning they're either going to cause a protein to not function as effectively or they're not going to really have an effect. One way they can be a you can have a mutation that doesn't have an effect is if it is a silent mutation. What happens is it changes the nucleotide sequence, but it doesn't change the amino acid sequence. And when we were doing the uh, 
proteins and mutations activity in class where you had those blocks and you were changing them out. What you should have noticed is for some of them, if you changed one out and added in another block with a different letter, it may have coded for the exact same amino acid. If it does that and it just doesn't change the amino acid sequence, it is a silent mutation because unless you do genetic testing and actually sequence the person's DNA, you will not know that there was a change. So it is possible that all of us have a bunch of silent mutations in our DNA that we're just unaware of because it doesn't affect anything in our lives. However, mutations can create new alleles. Um, if they're negative, a lot of times they'll be removed from the population. There are some times when they're not, which we'll talk about in another lesson. Um, or if they're neutral or they don't have a really like strong negative effect, those alleles can stick around in the population and thereby add to our genetic diversity or genetic variation. So remember, genetic variation is very important in terms of uh, allowing a species to survive because there's a higher chance that one of those different alleles that's been accumulated will prove beneficial if an environment changes. Um, that kind of those differences could be as something as simple as the uh, pictures of the moths you see here. All of these moths are the same exact species, but they have genetic variation, which causes difference in the pattern on their wings, which allows them to camouflage in different environments. Um, and so this genetic variation created by mutations um, is going to help increase the survivability of the species because you could have multiple environmental changes and still have multiple traits that could allow organisms to survive. So for example, if you have like a really dark environment, let's say there's a bunch of dark stuff on the trees that grows, these guys may be the ones that survive. Um, if you've got light colored trees, but if this thing right here looks like a pair of eyeballs from a predator, that could scare away something that would have otherwise eaten that moth. So once again, the genetic variation allows for the possibility of adaptation. So there are a number of uh, single nucleotide mutations. What you can do is you can change a single, uh, single nucleotide. So you could have, for example, um, an A to G mutation where an A is replaced by a G. So you basically change the nucleotide that's in an area. And for the most part, this is gonna change a single amino acid if it does. Uh, this is a missense mutation. A missense mutation is going to change the protein. So this is not a silent mutation. Then you can have a frame shift mutation. You can either remove or add an extra nucleotide, and this kind of shifts the reading frame over. When that happens, it changes the entire rest of the protein. And we're gonna look at how that happens here. So um, here we have uh, this is the wild type, and this is the mutation over here. So notice what we have here is a change from a single, um, a single nucleotide changing from an A to a T. Notice that that change, though, does not produce a change in the amino acid sequence. Therefore, this is a silent mutation. A missense mutation is going to be where an amino acid gets changed. So now instead, here in our third codon, we have a C being changed to an A, and that is enough to change this amino acid sequence from a proline in that region to a threonine. Now, depending on the region of the protein that that's found in, it could cause a dramatic change in structure, like with the hemoglobin protein. With others, there's the possibility that it could cause a small change in function, in which case that allele might not be uh, eliminated, or there's the chance it could cause no change in function if a similar amino acid is substituted, or if it's kind of like on the edges of the protein where it wouldn't make a difference to the structure. Then you have another possibility. Here we have this last amino, this last nucleotide changed from a C to a G, and it ends up changing the sequence from having an amino acid there and being able to continue on with the protein to a stop. We call that a premature stop codon, meaning it's stopping the production of the protein early, and we call that a nonsense mutation because usually it results in a much 
more shortened protein, and that protein's not going to be able to function. Um, and then you have a frame shift mutation. So notice here we have a sequence of A, G, C, G, T, A, C, C. Uh, on, the sec on the mutated region, it's A, G, C, G, and then we've taken out that T, A. So that shifts over the entire reading frame. So before the mutation, everything's the same. So it starts out with serine. Notice after the mutation, everything changes. It changes from valine, proline, tyrosine to alanine, leucine, leucine. And so that will create a completely different protein. If it happens towards the end of uh, the gene sequence, it may not cause a huge difference. If it happens towards the beginning of the gene sequence, then it would completely change the protein that's created. So that would make a very dramatic difference. Um, and so... Uh, this is kind of what I explained on the other slide. Let's talk now about chromosomal mutations. What ends up happening is, uh, for example, during uh, synapsis, when you have uh, bits of chromosomes break apart and then rejoin to their homologous chromosome, uh, they can rejoin in a way that ends up uh, either removing chunks of the gene or of the chromosome or adding chunks. So a number of chromosomal mutations can happen. So one thing that can happen is a deletion. So you'll notice this fake chromosome has five genes on it. A deletion mutation happened where a single gene was removed, in this case, gene four. Um, if it's a super vital uh, gene, and then it could be fatal in the organism that gets this mutated chromosome. Or if it's a large number of genes, it could be fatal. A duplication can be harmless, although depending on the number of genes and the specific genes that are duplicated, it could cause problems or even be fatal, but um, you accidentally add in an extra copy of some genes. So notice in this case, genes three and four have been duplicated, so we have extra copies of them. An inversion, a piece of chromosome breaks off and it rejoins, but it rejoins backwards. If those inverted genes aren't able to be read, then that can cause a problem. Uh, it can be very harmful, especially if it's a large suction of chromosome. An insertion will bring in a gene from an entirely different chromosome. So notice that this chromosome that ha has gene 9, it's green representing the fact that it comes from a different chromosome. If this is uh, inserted in the middle of a gene, it can interrupt that gene and make it non-functional, which can have some consequences. And then finally, we have a translocation. So if a translocation happens, what can happen is two different chromosomes can swap chunks. So these are not homologous chromosomes. They are carrying different genes. Um, this can be lethal or extremely harmful, depending on what genes are interrupted or if you make extra copies. And then, of course, we talked about non-disjunction. That can result in a trisomy. Um, like I've said before, the most common trisomy is trisomy 21. But what I wanted to point out is this is a karyotype. A karyotype shows you all of the chromosomes of an individual. So if when you were born, there was a reason to suspect that you might have had a chromosomal abnormality, they would have done a karyotype. In fact, um, back in the day, when I was teaching freshman bio, I often used to show the karyotype of one of our fellow biology teachers um, that was done of his son. Luckily, it was a normal karyotype. However, if you look at this karyotype, you should notice for each chromosome pair, like this, for example, is chromosome one, there are two of them. Chromosome two, there are two of them. Remember, you get a maternal and a paternal copy of each chromosome. However, if you start paying more attention, you'll notice that chromosome 21 has three copies instead of two. Notice also that chromosome 21 is the smallest chromosome on here. Um, it is the one of it is very rare to be able to have a duplication of any other chromosome and be able to survive to birth or even survive past childhood. For example, there is a trisomy of chromosome 18. Um, I've seen some pictures of people with, uh, with babies born with trisomy 18. They have severe birth defects, physical defects that that impair their survival. Uh, if you want to, you can look up those images, but if you're it can be really disturbing, especially because these are usually babies, because people with trisomy 18 tend to not survive past a few years of life. So if that would make you very disturbed or very upset, I wouldn't look at those pictures.
uh, just because it's, you know, really sad to see a, a, a baby with uh, some of the, the facial deformities that come with trisomy 18. Trisomy 21, though, um, is a much less severe. The people who have uh, Down syndrome are able to survive past childbirth, past childhood, and a great deal of them live very long, uh, very happy lives. Um, some of them are able to achieve a great deal of independence, depending on the severity of Down syndrome. It does cause some learning disabilities, uh, which might make it more difficult if they're severe enough for a person to be able to live independently. Um, there are some characteristic physical uh, changes, like for example, almond-shaped eyes. If you look at people with Down syndrome, regardless of like race or individual features, you'll see these kind of commonalities in their facial features that are. Um, characteristic of individuals with Down syndrome. Um, the chances of having a child with Down syndrome increase with the age of the mother. So usually women who are in their late 40s have a much higher chance of having a child with Down syndrome. All right, let's look at transfer of genetic information. You have two different methods. Uh, the one we've been talking about most of this time is vertical gene transfer, and that's going from parent to offspring. However, you can have some other types of gene transfer, um, which can go from one individual to another. You're not creating any new organisms. You're just modifying the genes of existing individuals. I will tell you, though, if you were thinking, ah, I can finally get a gene for whatever trait it is that I've been wanting to have, I'm afraid horizontal gene transfer mostly occurs in prokaryotes. Um, it allows them to increase their genetic variation despite the fact that they reproduce asexually. So there are a couple of different types. Uh, transformation can happen when you just have uh, like DNA that's sitting outside of a cell. You can induce a prokaryotic cell to take up this DNA. Transduction happens when you viruses are transmitting genetic information. Conjugation is um, going to be a direct cell-to-cell -cell transfer. And uh, transposition happens when you have exchanges of segments of DNA between molecules, not necessarily between organisms. So um, you can cause bacteria to take up these segments of DNA, either fragments or there are these structures called plasmids. And we may not get a chance to talk about plasmids much in class, but they are little round circular extra chromosomal structures. They have um, you know, maybe like a thousand, two thousand base pairs, and you can actually pass them from one bacterial cell to another. We can also use them in research, and um, we were going to do a bacterial transformation lab, but um, it's helpful to have a classroom for that. Transduction happens when viruses are used to insert genes into uh, target cells. Um, this is something that is often done in research. So if you're trying to introduce a gene into a cell, you can do that using viruses. Um, you can use this process with eukaryotes. It's just <clears throat> um, you don't have a 100% success rate when you do transformation or transduction, um, which is one thing if you have single-celled creatures. But if you don't have a 100% success rate of transduction in a eukaryotic organism, that means you're going to have a eukaryotic organisms with some cells who have this gene and some cells don't have this gene. Uh, transposition um, is a little crazy. It's You can... Um, Nickname these, these are nicknamed jumping genes. So transposons are these elements that jump from one segment of DNA to another. They move around the genome. Uh, you can use them in a lab to add segments of uh, DNA to another, to a chromosome. So for a while, that was kind of um, a well used technique in labs to insert genes into eukaryotic organisms. There's some really cool new techniques that are used to do that with greater efficiency nowadays. If you have a chance, look up CRISPR. CRISPR is um, a fairly easy to use as far as like modifying DNA um, method of inserting genes into other organisms. All right, uh, that is it. So our next lesson will be on genetics.